And I have never met anybody who'd want to blow up the Murrow Building. <laughs> I mean, to them, it would be totally counterproductive. Now, if they really wanted to blow up something, they would blow up something in Washington. But they didn't. They went to Heartland America out in Oklahoma, where none of the bureaucrats in Washington would be bruised by the bomb going off, and uh, blew it up there. And the people in Oklahoma, of course, uh, shed tears. And uh, the government rushed in and leveled the entire building and destroyed all the evidence. And then they con convicted Timothy McVeigh of killing 168 people with no evidence because they destroyed the evidence. How you convict somebody after destroying all the evidence, I don't know, but they did. <laughs> and uh, McVeigh, of course, was a patsy like uh, Lee Harvey Oswald in the Kennedy assassination, that sort of thing. Because there are always these drifters around and you can pick them up and uh, uh, do anything you want to with them. They're, they're considered throwaways anyway, so, so nobody cares what happens to them. And I don't know what's ever going to happen to Timothy McVeigh. I seriously doubt that he will ever be executed. <coughs> I think they'll just let the American people forget about him and uh, go on. But uh, anyway, to get back to Jekyll Island in 1910, uh, Senator Nelson Aldrich, the chairman of this meeting, was um, the father-in-law of John D. Rockefeller, Jr. Now, what had happened with John D. Rockefeller, who was financed by the Rothschilds, by the way, so it's really a Rothschild operation, uh, we always were trained to uh, think of the Rockefellers as terrible bandits and uh, unscrupulous uh, oligarchs and so forth. Well, in fact, they're, they're nobodies. The Rockefellers are nobody today in this country, but uh, uh, they, they, they're a convenient whipping boy. So Rockefeller, after the Rothschilds set him up to be the, the biggest monopoly in the world, Standard Oil in New Jersey, uh, they looked around for other fields. And so they put him into the medical profession. He revolutionized the medical profession in this country, converted it almost overnight from homeopathy and naturopathy to uh, allopathic medicine. Allopathic medicine, which I describe in my book, Murder by Injection, was a German system which relied on uh, radical surgery, lengthy hospital stays, and heavy use of drugs. When I say drugs, I mean drugs. And uh, so they put the medical profession into the drug business. And uh, that was a Rockefeller operation. Then uh, they decided to use Rockefeller to, to create their central bank and money monopoly. So they set up the National Monetary Commission. In 1907, the bankers in New York precipitated a panic of 1907. And people lost their money and banks closed and there was economic chaos. And uh, so obviously, then the bankers set up a public hue and cry for banking reform. You can read about it in the New York Times of that period. That uh, they said, we must have banking reform. Well, of course, all of the devastation, depredation was caused by the bankers themselves. I mean, uh, these people who put the money in these banks did not cause the banks to fail and they didn't want to lose their money, but they lost their money. So banking reform. So Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt set up the uh, National Monetary Commission. And uh, the um, National Monetary Commission was empowered to uh, make recommendations for banking reform. So the members of this commission, who of course were congressmen, uh, under Nelson Aldrich, the Republican majority leader, they traveled to Europe. They wanted to see how banks worked in Europe. So they were wined and dined by the Rothschilds in Paris and London. And they had a great time for about two years, but they did absolutely nothing. And uh, so people sort of forgot about banking reform. And after they had lulled the people into a total false sense of security, then they took off and went to uh, Jekyll Island, to the Millionaire's Club, and uh, secretly drafted their central bank plan which they called the Aldrich Plan after uh, Nelson Aldrich. Well, of course, the uh, Republicans adopted the Aldrich Plan as their uh, platform in 1912. And the banker-controlled press set up a great hue and cry against the Aldrich Plan as the Wall Street Plan, as the Big Banker's Plan. Then they called on Woodrow Wilson, the Democratic candidate, to offer a better plan. So, um, Woodrow Wilson put in the Democratic platform in 1912 the Federal Reserve Plan, which he offered as the alternative to the Aldrich Plan. 
Now, the interesting thing was it was exactly the same as the Aldrich plan, <laughs> but nobody noticed. And so, uh, but, but they couldn't elect Woodrow Wilson because he was not a very charismatic person. He was a dull professor. He was not a good speaker. Uh, he was totally unlikable. So he, he was born in my hometown, by the way, Stanton, Virginia. That's its only, the only claim to fame in Stanton is that I'm from there and Woodrow Wilson was there. Nobody else ever, <laughs> ever amounted to anything. So, uh, <clears throat> so they, they had this task of electing Woodrow Wilson in order to enact the Federal Reserve Act. But unfortunately, William Howard Taft was very uh, well liked. He was the president running for re-election. And um, there was general prosperity. I mean, there's no reason for the American people to trade uh, Taft for Woodrow Wilson. So the bankers called on an old friend, Theodore Roosevelt, who had set up the National Monetary Commission, and said, uh, Ted, we need you to go in and splinter the Republican vote. So Ted Roosevelt comes out of nowhere, starts the Bull Moose Party, runs for president himself, splits the Republican vote, uh, Woodrow Wilson is a shoe-in, and uh, Taft and Roosevelt, of course, disappear. So now they could have him sign the Federal Reserve Act. But the congressmen from the Middle West and the Far West were totally opposed to even the Federal Reserve Act because they knew it was a phony. And so uh, they were led by Congressman Charles Augustus Lindbergh uh, of Minnesota. And I've been to his home at Little Falls, Minnesota, and it's a wonderful museum. This man really gave his life to fight the bankers. And, of course, he was the father of the aviator. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, Lindbergh led the campaign against the Federal Reserve Act. And uh, <clears throat> so Paul Warburg himself, who was the author of the act, and the other bankers had to, for the first time in their life, come down to Washington and lobby in the halls of Congress to get the Federal Reserve Act passed. And, of course, they had to make a lot of promises, a lot of commitments, a lot of bribes. But uh, since they printed the money, it didn't matter. So, so they bribed the Congress to enact the Federal Reserve Act, which was signed, uh, but they still could not get a majority vote. So they had to wait till the Christmas vacation after Lindbergh and the Middle Western and uh, Western congressmen had departed for Christmas vacation. Then they brought the Federal Reserve Act before Congress on December 23rd after the opposition had left but they still had a quorum, they still could pass it. And so even the New York Times said, never has legislation of such uh, importance been passed under such circumstances. In other words, the whole Federal Reserve Act was passed through fraud, was passed more or less while Congress was in uh, Christmas uh, vacation. And um, so uh, Wilson signed the act into law under, on December 23rd, practically Christmas Eve, uh, and it became public law. So now that they had a central bank with the power to print all the money they wanted, a privately owned bank, and the Federal Reserve Act itself is an amazing act. It's an act of total monopoly because every word in it, first of all, all the money that the, the uh, bankers can print becomes an obligation of the U.S. government, which means the U.S. taxpayer. Second, the stockholders of this private bank uh, included in the legislation that no Federal Reserve Bank stock could ever be bought or sold on any exchange in the world. So in other words, the initial purchasers would own it in perpetuity, which is what happened because the Rothschilds, Warburgs, and Schiffs all bought the original stock in 1914 and have owned it ever since. And they've put it into foundations so it can never be touched. And uh, these foundations are the real government of the United States, Rockefeller Foundation. Nearly all of your major legislation in the United States is prepared by these foundations. And they submit it to Congress, and of course they have enormous staffs and uh, billions of dollars. So they bring the, the legislation before Congress. And it's impeccable, it's researched and it's phrased and everything is done just right. And uh, so, of course, the Congress accepts it. And they look around and they say, is anybody objected to the, any of this? And, of course, there's total silence. Nobody objects. So it becomes law. <laughs> and that's why you have laws constantly passed by Congress, which are actively opposed by 85% of the American people. 
Almost everything is done